and just ignore it effectively has no more success probability uh, than just randomly guessing. Right? So what we've sort of said so far is that the advantage of the adversary is always going to be zero. But that's not quite true because even if two values are different as polynomials, they might be the same as integers. Right? And if they're the same as integers, then we should give him the same value, but we give him different values because we're using this heuristic where we just give random strings as encodings to everything. So the situation is that we might get unlucky, and specific values of the, that we might assign to these variables x, y, and z, if we then compute g to the whatever it is, we'll end up with equality. In other words, the two polynomials might be equal when we assign a particular value, integer value, to each of their formal variables, even though they're different as integers. And in that case, our simulation doesn't make any sense. The adversary should have seen two things that were equal. We use this heuristic where we didn't assign them to be equal, and we're no longer correctly running things. So in order to show that DDH is hard, we have to bound the probability that that happens. We have to bound the probability that for a particular x, y, and z integers, if we plug those in for the variable, for the formal variables big X, big Y, and big Z, we'll get equality between two of the values that the adversary computed at some point. All right, so let's just go ahead and do that. It's very boring math, but it's not too bad. So the adversary is given five values, 1, x, y, x, y, x times y, and z. And then he makes Q queries, and each of those queries ends up generating the value uh, that will, as it happens, be of this form, just a, a linear combination of, of these things that he started with, because he has no way to generate anything else. And the thing is that each of these is a polynomial of degree at most 2. Right? The total degree here is 1 everywhere except this xy term. So that's degree 2. And that means that if these two values are going to be equal, if, two, if the values of two of these polynomials that he generates are going to be equal, uh, when we plug in x, y, and z as actual values for the formal variables, then that means that we have a root, that we found a root of the polynomial that is the difference of two of these. So maybe x minus z. That's a polynomial of degree 1. And maybe it just so happens that we, that we picked x and z, little x and little z, that are the same number. And so we should make them equal to each other. Um, and so the question is, what is the probability that the difference of polynomials, in other words, another polynomial, of degree t uh, 2 is, uh, is equal to 0? In other words, what is, the, how many, what is the probability that we happen to find a root over random choices of the variables x, y, and z, uh, little x, little y, and z as integers? And the answer is that, that for a degree 2 polynomial, it's at most 2 over p, right? where p is the number of elements in the finite field. And we have to worry about collisions between any two of the elements in the list. So the list has at most 5 plus q values, 5 that the adversary was just given, q more that the adversary generated as part of his queries. And so there's q plus 5 choose 2, which is on the order of q plus 5 squared um, uh, pairs on this list. Any one pair collides with probability at most 2 over p. And so the probability of a collision is 2 times q plus 5 squared over p, give or take. And if there was a collision, then we were unlucky. The simulation was unfaithful, and we didn't run things the way the adversary might know that we should have run them. And so we can't say anything about the adversary's advantage in that case. But if we weren't lucky, sorry, if we weren't unlucky, then in fact we can bound the, the, the advantage at one half. And so putting everything together, what we end up with is a statement that says that in, if an adversary in a generic group model makes at most Q group oracle queries, then its advantage in solving DDH is at most this value that we computed um, 2 times q plus 5 squared over p, um, where the, the order of the group is p. Okay, so what does that mean? We, it's a theorem, but 
theorems can, you can prove things that don't have any interesting consequences. The interesting consequence here is that if Q is much, much smaller than P squared, sorry, is, is much, much smaller than P, and in particular is much smaller than the square root of P, then plugging that into here, we end it with an advantage that's quite small. Right? So for example, if Q is about P to the 1 quarter, then Q squared is about P to the 1 half. And so this is the, the, that expression says that the advantage is at most about uh, square root of P. Right? So if P is 160 bits, which is what we were led to earlier, then the advantage of the, uh, the, the adversary we've now bounded at about uh, 2 to the minus 80, um, which is maybe OK. Right? And, and if we then say, well, in the real world, adversaries don't interact with group oracles, so we can't count how many queries they made, then we can say, well, the adversary can only compute so fast. So we can only perform one group operation per time step, per Turing machine transition. And probably you can perform even fewer, but that's a, that, that's a good bound. And so that says that if the adversary um, runs for fewer than square root of p steps, then it's going to have a small advantage in solving the DDH problem. Right? Generically, if the adversary is generic. If the adversary is not generic, all bets are off as far as this particular theorem is concerned. Right? So one thing to think about um, now before we maybe go to a five minute break is that uh, we just said that this proved that the decisional of the Fiamman problem is hard. Uh, where in fact in pairing based groups, we actually know that the decision to Fiamman problem is not hard. It's easy. Jusenlian showed exactly how you could solve it. If you're trying to decide whether t is equal to g to the uh, a times b, then you apply the pairing twice, once with g to the a paired with g to the b, once with g paired with t, and you can compare those two values for equality, and if they are equal, then you know that t is in fact g to the ab, which means that you are given a DDH tuple, which means you should say yes. Uh, if they're not equal, then you say no, this is a random element. And our proof completely ignored that, right? Our proof said that DDH was hard unconditionally. And the reason that it said that DDH was hard unconditionally is that if we, this proof doesn't apply to pairing crypto groups because they have the additional structure that our group didn't capture, that our proof didn't capture. Our proof said nothing about pairings. It didn't give the adversary the ability to compute pairings, which is crucial for this particular algorithm for solving DDH. So if a generic group proof fails to capture some property of that group, then it's useless. It doesn't capture the adversary capabilities, and it doesn't accurately tell us whether some problem that we proved is hard really is hard. So I think now is a good time for maybe a five minute break. Let's reconvene at uh, a little past 5.15, 5.17. Um, and then we'll pick up from here to talk more about uh, 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 the, what, 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 uh, what's called the, the Uber assumption. Uh, what um, Bonnet and Boyen call the Uber assumption family. They're being a little funny, but uh, that's what they call it. Um, and any assumption that falls within this class of assumptions already has a proof of security in the generic group model given by this theorem of uh, Bonnet and Boyen and, and Go. All right, so what this is going to do is it's going to take the proof that we gave for DDH. It's going to pull out the parts that are sort of specific to DDH and replace them with more general things. And it's going to add pairing structure. So it's going to give the, the adversary not just an algorithm for computing the group operation in the group G, but algorithms for computing the group operations in G, in G1, sorry, in G1, G2, and GT, and for computing a pairing that takes the opaque representation of an element from G1 and the opaque representation of an element from G2 and outputs the opaque representation of the appropriate element in the group GT. All right, so let's look at this assumption. So pi, again, is going to be this uh, ring of polynomials with as many as n different uh, uh, variables. We had three, right? We had x, y, and z. 
those were our formal variables, we're going to generalize that up to m. And we're going to have p and q are both going to be lists of polynomials of s elements. So in other words, there's going to be s elements, s different polynomials given in, in p, s different elements in, of polynomials given in q. And you can think of these as being uh, the values that the adversary gets to see in the group G1 uh, and the group G2. Um, sorry, in this case, this is the, the just G times G, G, T. So P is the, the values that the adversary gets to see in the group G. And Q is the values that the adversary gets to see in the group G, T. And then F is the target. It's the value that he's trying to tell from random. Right? And we'll define some sort of degree to be um, twice the degree of pi. This should just be the degree of qi and the degree of f. This is the maximum degree that the adversary is able to generate. Again, remember that this is, um, this is something that came up in the DDH calculation. We needed to know that he could generate polynomials of degree 2. So that degree 2 is going to be replaced by this degree d. Um, and we're going to need this technical independence condition, which says that, if you remember, I said that there's no way for the adversary to compute x times y given 1, x, and y. And here we're going to ask that, again, f be independent of the sets p and q, which means that f can't be expressed in the form some constant times pi times pj plus some constant times qk, right? And the reason that we're able to take pi and pj is that this is where the pairing comes in. We're able to take two values that are in the list p and pair them together and get a value in the target group that's uh, equal to f or not. Right, so f is dependent on p and q if it can be expressed this way. f is independent of p and q if it can't. And given all of this setup, the Uber assumption theorem statement says that generically, if f is independent of p and q, if it can't be expressed that way, then an adversary that makes it most q queries has advantage at most q plus, this r should be p, I apologize for that, um, q plus 2s plus 2 quantity squared times d divided by 2 times p. All right, so really, frankly, this looks the same as what we were doing before, except that we had q plus 5 here originally, and our d was set to 2. And we didn't have this half, half term. That, that's not really that interesting. Right? And that advantage is in distinguishing e of gg to this f polynomial from random given the pi polynomials in the group g and the qi polynomials in the group, e, in the group gt, again, all with the right exponent. Sorry, R is, R is just a typo for P. It's the order of the group. I, I apologize for that. Yes. You mean big P and big P? Yes. No, yes, absolutely. And, and it comes in here. And, and the difference is that Q values are already in GT, so you can't apply the pairing to them. But P values are in the group G, so you can apply the pairing to them, which is why you can end up with a polynomial that takes two values in P and multiplies them together. Does that make sense? In other words, we've got the group G, and we can apply the pairing to it, and then we end up in the group GT, but we got this multiplication in the exponent. And that's what this is intended to capture. So. Let me give you one example for how we solve this. Remember we talked about DBDH. DBDH was you're given G, G to the A, G to the B, G to the C, and you're asked to distinguish E of GG to the A times B times C from random. Right? So if we just plug that in, we again define X, Y, Z here. We set P to be 1 X, Y, Z, which corresponds to G g to the a, g to the b, g to the c. These are the values the adversary gets to see in the group g. Um, q, we just give him a value 1, which is e of g, g. So not really very interesting at all. And he's asked to distinguish f, which is 
x, y, z from random. In other words, he's asked to distinguish e of g, g to the a times b times c from a random element. And if we just plug this in, sorry, again, this r should be p, then his max advantage, based on the theorem that we claimed before, is at most 3 times q plus 8 squared over 2 times p, which again is on the order of q squared over p. Sorry, again, r just stands for p, the group order. q is the number of operations the adversary is allowed to perform. Right? And, and so if we ever prove this Uber theorem, then the proof for the fact that dbh is generically hard in pairing base groups would be easy. We just plug this in and it as a consequence of the theorem. And that's true for a whole bunch of other assumptions that we might care about. Um, and in fact, you can go to the BBG paper and read their proof, and it looks a lot like the proof that we just presented for DDH security, but with a lot more of a mess. So we again set up the environment, we answer the adversary queries with completely random encodings um, from the ring of polynomials. Uh, at some point later, we assign random values to each of the variables, and then we check whether we were unlucky, whether at any point two polynomials were actually equal over the integers that were not equal as polynomials with, um, with uh, synthetic variables. And so we misled the adversary. And if we count the number of polynomials, we end up with q plus uh, 2s plus 2. The probability that two polynomials are equal is um, uh, the degree of the, their difference divided by, again, sorry, this should be p. That, that's just a generalization of that 2 over p term that we had before. The max degree is, well, it, it might be f. It might be the max of the elements that we were given in gt. Or it might be twice the maximum of the elements that were given in pi because you could take those elements and pair them together. And now you effectively are multiplying the exponent. So in other words, if you had g to the x and g to the y, in the group G, then you apply the pairing, you end up with E of GG to the X times Y. So you went from polynomials of degree one, X and Y, to polynomial of degree two, X times Y. Right, so that's the max degree. That's the same calculation that we had on an earlier slide, except I had some typos. And the, the, the proof basically is otherwise unchanged. Right, and, it, and Xavier later, Xavier Boyan later wrote a paper where he generalized this, uh, this Uber theorem even more to other kinds of pairings, what I mentioned are type two and type three pairings, pairings in which the groups G1 and G2 are not the same group, um, to problems with multiple solutions, um, like uh, the strong Diffie-Hellman problem, solutions that have multiple components, rational functions, all sorts of things. Basically, if your assumption doesn't fit into Xavier's generalized framework, then it's a very, very weird assumption indeed. Now, I want to talk about one assumption that does, in fact, fit into Xavier's assumption, but that I think might be interesting to think of as kind of maybe a slightly different direction in doing pairing-based cryptography. And that's the, the linear assumption that uh, Professor Okamoto mentioned earlier. Um, in which we have the values h, u, and v in the group g1, or equivalently in the group g, and then also u to the a and v to the b. And we're asked to distinguish h to the alpha plus beta from random. Right? So we've got h, u, v, and then u to the alpha, v to the beta. And then we have to tell whether some value that we're given is h to the alpha plus beta or just h to the c for some completely unrelated c. Um, why do we care about linear? Well, it turns out linear gives us all sorts of things. Amongst other things, it gives us a very nice Elgamal style encryption. It's really sort of two Diffie-Hellman problems stuck together. And the reason that we really care about linear is that we think that it's secure, that the assumption holds, and therefore that this particular uh, encryption scheme works, uh, even when the decision Diffie-Hellman problem is easy, as it is on pairing-based groups. And I'll formalize what that means in just a second. But the fact is that we could generalize linear even more. So I said, you're given u and v, and then this h. And then you're given u to some random alpha and, some v, and v to some other random beta. 
And then you're asked to distinguish h to the, the sum of those two random values, h to the alpha plus beta from random. Um, we can generalize that by replacing u and v with a whole list of different uh, generators, g1 through gk, and then each one of them to a different random value, g1 is to the r1, g2 is to r2, gk is to the rk, and then we're asked to distinguish h of the sum of those values from random. All right. Now, if you just plug in k, this is parameterized by k. If you plug in k equals 1, it turns out you'll just see the Diffie-Hellman problem that we had earlier. Right? You have g, h, g to the a, and you're asked to distinguish h to the a from random. If you plug in k equals 2, you get the linear assumption from the last slide. You just have to substitute these unawkward g1, g2, r1, r2. You have to substitute u, v, alpha, and beta. But it's otherwise the same. But the interesting thing is that as you increase the value of k, as you go to the three, three linear problem, the four linear problem, the five linear problem, you end up with a strict, strictly weaker assumption. So two linear is weaker than linear, three linear is a weaker assumption than two linear, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so these are, um, or I, I, the way it's formalized is that G1 through GK and H are randomly chosen uniformly from the group G when you pose the problem. And so the probability that any, of, any two of them are the same is, is, uh, is exponentially small. Any comment on what would happen if H was one of the Gs? Um, yes. So, so the, depending on, on, on what K was, you could solve the problem. Um, for example, if, it were, if we were just solving the two linear problem, then you're given u and v and u and u to the alpha uh, and uh, v to the beta, and you're asked to compute. Um, anyway, I, I think it's solvable. Basically, basically it's about bad things happen. Uh, but they only happen with, with small probability. Um, and it's easy to test for also when you're trying to build your crypto system. Um, so the, the idea here is that if you think that someday somebody's going to come up with an algorithm to solve four linear, then you're going to build your scheme based on five linear. Um, or if you think that the first seven linears are going to be easy to solve, but the eighth one, that's where the hardness really starts, then maybe you instantiate your scheme based on eight linear. Okay, so I claim that, that these problems are progressively uh, harder. In other words, the assumption that the problem is hard is progressively weaker. Let's talk a little bit about how that happens. So, OK, let's look at linear again. So u, v, h, u to the alpha, v to the beta, and then this value that we're trying to tell whether it's h to the alpha plus beta or not. Let's imagine we had a mythical object. This object is about as, uh, uh, you're about as likely to find this object as you are to find a unicorn. But that's OK. Let's pretend we had it. Let's pretend we have a three multilinear map. So that's going to be some function e sub 3, such that it takes three elements of the group G, and it outputs an element in some group GT that, and obeying the trilinearity property. In other words, it's linear in each of its arguments. So if you pair G to the R with G to the S with G to the T, you end up with what you would get by pairing, or I guess in this case, three pairing, G, 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 to, and then raising whatever that is to the power R times S times T. All right, so if you think about it, a two multilinear map is just the bilinear map that we have and work with all the time. Three multilinear map is stretched out a little bit more. We don't have any of these. There's actually good mathematical reasons to think that we never will, but let's pretend. All right? So if we, in fact, had a three multilinear map, we would be able to break the linear assumption. And let's just see how. We would compute this three pairing of u to the a, that's this element, with v and h. And we would also compute the three pairing of u with v to the b and h. These are all values that were given. So we can certainly compute this, uh, this map and take the product. And if you look at what that gives you by the bilinearity, the trilinearity property in this case, the a comes out of this pairing and the b comes out. And they're pairing the same value, which is u with v with h. And so we end up with u v h all applied to E3, and that value raised to A plus B. All right? Now we take the value Z, and we're trying to tell whether, in fact, it is equal to this. 
And so we just compute u v paired with 3 paired with z. And we test whether this is, in fact, equal as a bit string to this or not. And if it is, then we know that z is actually equal to h to the a plus b. And if it's not, then we know it's not. All right, does this, does this operation make sense? So again, we're breaking the linear assumption based on a three multilinear multi map, something that I don't actually believe we're ever going to have. But if we did, the linear assumption would just break. It would just go away. OK, so that's the two linear assumption, or linear, is broken by the presence of a three multilinear map. And in fact, if you go back to the slide we had earlier that defined the k linear family of functions, this attack generalizes. If you have a k plus 1 multilinear map, then you can break the k linear assumption for any k. Um, one instantiation of this that might be a little bit more interesting is if you, if you set k equals 1. Remember, we said that one linear is just DDH. Right? So if you have a two multilinear map, which is to say a bilinear map, something we really actually have, then this generalization says you should be able to break DDH. And that's exactly what Jews and Nguyen showed. Right? So we're back to that Jews and Nguyen statement. But this is a generalization of that if you have these other multilinear maps that we don't have. Right? So now here is a claim. Um, if you can solve, if you have a solver for the k plus 1 linear problem, you also have a solver for the k linear problem. Um, and this is really a really super simple exercise. The idea is basically that the k plus 1 linear problem just is one more random garbage element on top of a k linear problem. So if you just invent that element, if you invent a gk and gdk to the rk, and you fix z appropriately, then you can use your k plus 1 solver to solve the k problem. So that's easy. Right? So in other words, the k plus 1, the k linear problem is no harder than the k plus 1 linear problem because you can't ever have a situation where you can solve k plus 1 linear but not k linear. Right? Does, does that make sense? So the problems at least don't get easier. And now here's the hard side to prove. The claim is that in a generic group of, in an appropriate generic group, k plus 1 linear is actually still hard even if k linear is easy. So in other words, the problems really do become harder and harder to solve. Right? So does anybody have an idea for how we might prove this? Well, so if we think about it, in order to prove this, we somehow have to give the adversary the ability, generically, to solve k linear problems because we're saying that k plus 1 linear is hard, even though k linear is easy. Well, how, how is it easy? It's easy if there's a way to solve it. How do we give the adversary a way to solve it? We are going to have to give him a k linear oracle, right? Some way of something that solves the k linear problem for him so that he can you try to use that to break k plus 1 linear in a generic way, right? Uh, I don't know how to give the adversary access to a k linear oracle. But I do know how to give the adversary access to a k plus 1 multilinear map. That just uses the same operations that we were using before uh, to compute the pairing. Effectively, you have many elements of the group G, and you just pair them all together by computing the product of k plus 1 polynomials in the ring pi. All right? And we know by the argument that we had earlier that if you have a k plus 1 multilinear map, then in fact you can break k linear. Right? There's a simple generic attack that works. And so if we're giving the adversary access to a k plus 1 multilinear map, then we, in particular, we're giving him access to a k linear oracle. He can just implement that oracle himself using the algorithm that we had before. And yet we're able to show in this generic group, equipped with a k plus 1 multilinear map, that the k plus 1 linear problem remains hard, again, generically. OK, so that's kind of the very long background introduction that I wanted to give for generic groups, how they're used in cryptography, what some of the ways that they, they might be helpful to us for proving assumptions might be. In the last 15 minutes or so of the talk, I wanted to make some arguments back and forth about whether this whole business of using generic group models uh, proofs to t argue about assumptions is actually a worthwhile thing to do. So let's start by talking about some things that the generic group model gets right, and then maybe transition to talking about some things that it doesn't get quite so right. All right, so 
Here is the first argument for why the generic group model system is good for pairing base crypto. And that's that no scheme with an assumption, no assumption that's been proved generically secure has ever been broken in pairing base crypto. In other words, all the breaks of assumptions, and there have been some, all the breaks in assumptions used in pairing base crypto either were for assumptions that didn't have proofs in the generic group model or for assumptions where the proofs were just wrong. Uh, anybody can get a proof wrong. The fact that somebody got a proof wrong is no big argument one way or another. Right? So, so that's actually pretty good. It says if you actually come up with a correct proof for your assumption in the generic group model, then chances are, historically, that nobody's going to be able to break your assumption. Now, that might just be because nobody's looking, because they say, well, I don't know what to do with this assumption if it's generically secure. But it also says that we don't really know how to break this barrier of genericity. Right? Now, what I think is an even stronger argument is this business of discrete logarithm problems with auxiliary info. Right? So let's imagine that you're given G, and then I would call it W, is G to the gamma for some secret gamma. And you're asked to compute gamma. That's just the discrete logarithm problem. Or you're asked to output a pair where C is an integer, and then you're given G to the 1 over gamma plus C. Don't even ask why some people think that this is a good problem to solve. But that's the strong Diffie-Hellman problem. Or maybe the BDHI problem is to distinguish E of GG to the 1 over gamma from random. There's a whole class of assumptions that you can make like this. And it turns out that sometimes we don't just want to give W. We don't just want to give G to the gamma. But we want to give additional auxiliary information that maybe will help the attacker. Right? So we give him not just g to the gamma, but maybe also g to the gamma squared up to g to the gamma to the q to the k. So in other words, maybe you'll have a thousand different powers of gamma, all g to the. Right? g to the gamma, g to the gamma squared, g to the gamma cubed, g to the gamma to the fourth. Uh, maybe there will be a hole in the middle. There's a whole class of assumptions that are all of this structure. But if you ever were able to compute gamma, you would break them. Right? So that's uh, k discrete logarithm, k strong Diffie-Hellman, k BDHI. k captures the length of this list of auxiliary uh, information. And there's many other assumptions like this. All right, so when these kinds of uh, assumptions were introduced, they came with a proof in the generic model that says no adversary can break one of these assumptions generically in fewer than, remember all the times before we saw q squared over p. Sorry, r just stands for p here. q squared over p. But here in this generic group proof, there was this extra term of k that popped up in the way that the proof worked out. All right, so before we had kind of q squared, now we have q squared times k. Uh, that, this comes from the degree, by the way, um, right? Because we had gamma to the k, that's kind of high degree. Um, and so the thing about this is that that said that you might be able to solve the, the problem with probability, say, uh, with, with number of queries, say, p to the 1 third, so cube root of p instead of the generic square root of p, if you had a long enough list of auxiliary information. In other words, this didn't actually give an algorithm for how to do that, but it didn't rule it out either. It left the possibility open that given enough auxiliary information, you might actually be able to break the scheme more efficiently, the discrete logarithm problem more efficiently than if you were just given g and g to the gamma. All right? All right, so Professor Chon actually showed an algorithm that did exactly this. So you could view this as really as fulfilling the prophecy left by the generic group model proof for, uh, for, for these, this class of assumptions. So, uh, so he showed that if R or P, the group order, satisfies a certain property. So in particular, for example, R minus 1 has a divisor of the appropriate order. Um, and you're given K equals R to the 1 third. Then, in fact, you have an algorithm for the, discrete logarith for the K discrete logarithm problem, and therefore for KSDH and all these other kinds of assumptions that requires R to the 1 third queries. Right, so exactly matching what was uh, guaranteed by the, 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 what was not ruled out by the generic group proof. Right, so this is uh, 
again, th so this prophecy didn't actually specify how you might get a, go around doing that. But Professor Cho was actually able to match the, the generic group result. So that, in some sense, is a very strong argument for the generic group proof, because it captured how far we were able to go. And we're able to go no further than that so far. OK, so that's what I wanted to say in favor of the generic group model. I wanted to talk a little bit about some downsides to the generic group model. Now, one, side, one downside I think we've all already seen which is that the proofs are basically all of the same form. They are very boring. They're very long. They're filled with all this very um, detailed and finicky notation about polynomial rings and these things. And you can multiply these polynomials. And then you have to worry about getting unlucky. Uh, the, the, the proofs are no fun to read. And it's not clear anybody ever actually reads them. And then the punchline from the proofs is that you just get something that looks like q squared over r. No matter what assumption you prove, out comes q squared over r. Um, and that's really not very nice, especially when people stop proving assumptions, or they stop giving evidence that an assumption holds, and start proving schemes directly, doing away with assumptions altogether, which is, a, I think, a terrible trend. Right, so the proofs are bad. That can be helped somewhat by the Uber theorem and other ways of proving many different assumptions are secure all at once. Um, another problem with the generic group model is that it's unsound in the same way that the random oracle model is unsound. What do I mean by that? I mean that what we're doing is we're idealizing the adversary. We're idealizing the situation. So we'd like to be able to say that if the scheme is secure generically, and if we only deal with a generic enough group when we instantiate it in the real world. In other words, we say, well, we don't really know how to use the real elliptic curve groups in any way other than evaluating group operation and applying the pairing. So they're generic enough. They're cool. And we plug in our scheme with our assumption into that group. Then the scheme should remain secure. All right? So, so in other words, what we'd really like from an philosophically what we really like from an idealization is that when we work with real groups that are ideal enough, our security doesn't go poof. Um, and in fact, with, uh, there, there's an existence proof by Dent. It's very ugly, um, but it's still an existence proof. And it's an analog to a result about random oracles by Kennedy Goldreich and Levy from uh, 98. There's an existence proof by Dent that shows that every scheme that's secure, that there exists a scheme, sorry, not every, uh, that there exists a scheme that is actually secure in the generic group model and insecure in every group, no matter what group you instantiate it in. So in other words, it's, there's no group that's generic enough for this particular scheme. Now this scheme, again, very contrived, very weird, and it's, a, it's an example of proving a scheme secure generically rather than proving an assumption secure generically. So it's not, it's not really going to what we're talking about here, but it, is, it, it does point out the generic group model is unsound. And then here's another maybe less philosophical, maybe more immediate way of, of talking about generic groups, which is that, frankly, we prove decision diffie hellman problems secure, generically. And then if we instantiate it over groups that have a pairing, now it's not secure. And the pairing is even more than that. The pairing doesn't just output into this completely generic group GT. It outputs into a group that's a subgroup of uh, the multiplicative group of a finite field. And on finite fields, we can do very efficient discrete logarithm with index calculus. And if you end up picking the, your group GT to be too small, to, be, to live in too small of a finite field, then you're vulnerable to discrete logarithm attacks. And in fact, when people didn't realize that this was an issue that they needed to deal with, they sometimes worked in group super singular curves that had GT groups that were too small and were vulnerable to uh, discrete logarithm in sub-exponential time. And this was the observation in the Menezes Okamoto Vanstone paper from 91 that was one of these classic destructive uses of the pairing. They said, well, you guys have picked this particular curve, and you've chosen these particular parameters, and you didn't realize we had a pairing. And the moment we use the pairing, we end up in a finite field that's too small. We apply discrete log in that finite field. Maybe it's 320 bits, for example. 
something like that. We solve your uh, discrete logarithm problem. You're done. So that's an example of where, in some sense, by our parameters for specifying how big GT should be, how big the finite field f sub q to the k should be, we're already taking into account non-genicity of the pairing. Right. Um, some slightly less dramatic examples. It turns out over certain kinds of uh, binary elliptic curves where you're working over uh, GF2 to the M, but the actual param uh, coefficients A and B are defined over some smaller, um, um, some smaller binary uh, field, then you can actually speed up Pollard row discrete logarithm algorithm by this factor of uh, square root of m over l by using the Frobenius. Uh, this is not super exciting, but it is using some additional structure of these curves to speed up an operation and run it actually faster than predicted in generic, uh, uh, generically. All right. Um, another example, this is due to uh, Stern, Poincheval, and uh, Malone, Lee, and Smart at Crypto 2002, is that uh, there was a proof in 2001 by Brown that showed that the elliptic curve uh, uh, DSA signature algorithm is generic, is secure in a generic group. And then Stern et al. showed that, in fact, finite fields, sorry, elliptic curve groups are not generic because there's a very efficient way of computing inverses, right? The, uh, the inverse of a point x comma y that's on elliptic curve is x comma minus y. And there is a certain step in the ECDSA encoding operation that depends only on the x-coordinate. And so it turns out that you, given a point p, the point minus p has the same x-coordinate because you just flip the y-coordinate, you don't change the x-coordinate, and that breaks the, uh, that actually breaks Brown's proof. So that's an example of non-genericity. You can form another element with the same x-coordinate. That's, x-coordinate is something that's a, a detail of group implementation. It's not part of the uh, official representation, but you can form that element just by performing operations that are generic, by taking a point and computing minus of that point. Right, And then here's another example. So closely related to the generic group model is the generic ring model. The generic ring model is when you're working with rings like RSA. And you can't give the adversary the ring order n because the adversary is computationally unbounded. He could factor n. So instead, you just give him access to the group operations. And the operations can sometimes fail if he happens to run across something that doesn't have an inverse. Because in a ring, not every element has an inverse. For example, modulo n, where n is a composite, any number that has a, a non-trivial GCD with n will not have an inverse. Right? So a really beautiful result by Aurora uh, in 2009 that also uh, is based on some work based, uh, due to Brown and Stephen Galbraith says that in the generic ring model, in other words, if we weaken the power of the adversary, the RSA problem is equivalent to factoring. If you remember way, way, way back in the beginning, we talked about this bonevin katassen result that said that if you weaken the reduction and leave the adversary unweakened, then RSA is not equivalent to factoring. What this says is the opposite. It says if you weaken the adversary but not the reduction, then the RSA problem is equivalent to factoring. If the adversary can only perform generic ring operations, then he cannot solve RSA without also doing something that gives us the factorization of n. Right? And this is really a beautiful result. It's a great paper. I strongly urge you to read it. Um, and it was also quick, quickly shown to be uh, completely meaningless, in some sense, by uh, Jaeger and Schwenk uh, the same year. Uh, because they showed that if you use the same arguments made by Agarwal and Marr, then computing the Jacobi symbol is also equivalent to factoring in the generic ring model. Right? So, so what that says is that no algorithm that works in the generic ring model can compute the Jacobi symbol without also doing something that's equivalent to factoring the modulus. Um, now, it just so happens that we know how to compute the Jacobi symbol of a number. Right? That's not hard. 
Um, and it's not hard because we use the bit representation of the integers that we're computing the Jacobi symbol of. We're doing something non-generic. But the fact that we can do that means that this proof may not have more content than this proof. Somebody tomorrow will come up with a non-generic factoring algorithm and um, will think of factoring as no harder than computing Jacobi symbols. Right, so that was my list of arguments against the generic uh, group model. And I want to close in just the last few minutes with a research agenda that I propose to all of you as something that I think is really worth doing. Um, so to introduce the agenda, what I want to claim is that we're in a funny situation in pairing-based crypto. On the one hand, the generic group model seems to capture everything that we know about pairing-based groups. Right? We don't know how to break schemes non-generically, and all of the structure that we know how to extract from these groups, more or less, is already encoded in the generic structure where we have the pairing available to us. And yet, these are really very, very non-generic groups. They have all this structure. The, the, it's elliptic curves from certain families over particular finite fields, with the sizes all chosen very carefully. And now we've got this pairing, and that maps us into this group of r roots of unity that's embedded in a finite field, that's a field extension of a particular size. You would think that there's some non-generic structure that we could pull out that would break an assumption non-generically. And so my proposed problem is to do exactly that, to break an assumption that's proved secure in the generic group model. So to break an assumption non-generically in pairing-based crypto groups. Right? And this is not really one problem, but many, many different kinds of problems all stuck together. So let's try to detail it a little bit more. All right, so what assumption should you break? Well, what would be lovely is to break an assumption that somebody's already used in some published paper. Go to a paper, you know, go to ePrint, find a paper that uses some funny assumption, break that assumption using non-generic properties of elliptic curves. That's probably hard. So I think it's also reasonable to break an assumption that nobody has used before, but that falls within classes of assumptions that people already like. Like, for example, pick something within the Uber family that we talked about earlier and break that. Um, I think it's probably also even OK to break a completely new assumption that you invent so long as it's kind of like the other assumptions that people work with. And how kind of like, maybe we can argue about, but it would be a, a nice start. All right, so break where? It'd be nice if you could break it kind of generically on every curve that, every pairing-friendly elliptic curve. It would be OK to break it on one specific pairing-friendly curve that people already use. And I suppose it would also be OK to invent a new pairing-friendly curve. You might need some other mathematicians to help you come up with new pairing-friendly curves, because we already have so many. Um, but maybe there's some specific family of pairing-friendly elliptic curves on which your funny new assumption can be broken. Uh, and when I mean break, well, it'd be great if you actually came up with a polynomial time algorithm that actually solves the problem. But it might even be OK to weaken uh, the, the exponential algorithm lower than what the generic group uh, proof claims you should be able to do. And there was sort of a menu of three choices on the last two slides and two choices here that gives, what, um, 18 different ways to break, uh, to, to solve this problem that I posed. Uh, but even more generally than that, what I hope that I uh, conveyed today is that pairing base crypto is doing lots of great things, but it's doing lots of great things based on many, many different assumptions. Each paper has its own new ones. And these assumptions are, I think, not getting as much scrutiny as they should. And they really need more scrutiny. And cryptographers should scrutinize the assumptions. And I think mathematicians who better understand the elliptic curve structure can really help. And with that, and with apologizing for running over, uh, I'll uh, thank you all for uh, having me and for hearing me out. And take any questions that you have.